Magic is found in every room where people connect over a shared purpose. In this weekly podcast, Luke, Hannah, and Chris explore the role of purpose, courage, mindset, and culture in every leader's quest for transformational performance. Hello, welcome to Magic in the Room. I am Hannah Braderud. And I'm Chris Province. And I'm Luke Freeman. Glad to have everyone with us today. Fun topic that we've talked about quite a bit in depth, but today we're going to kind of zoom up to 30,000 feet on emotional intelligence. So for those who have listened to previous episodes, we have dug in in depth to a lot of emotional intelligence discoveries, so specific behaviors and approaches to leverage emotional intelligence in our pursuit of purpose, uh, empowered performance, uh, and performance as, as an individual and as courageous leaders. But today we thought, well, we haven't really talked about, you know, broad strokes. What is emotional intelligence and why is it important? So opening question for today, Chris and Hannah, I want to ask you guys, you know, what's a keystone kind of formative moment that has stuck with you on your journey towards emotional intelligence, uh, or maybe something that made you aware that this needs to be on my radar. You know, I, I can't just do the book smarts learning. I also have to do some emotional intelligence work as well. So, uh, yeah. What, what stands out? Yeah, I have a example that's always been, that was kind of formative and pivotal for me. And it stems back to when we were all in school together um, in this organizational dynamics program um, back at University of Oklahoma a uh, decade or so ago. And part of that, um, the format for those courses is we had to do peer evaluations. We worked a lot in teams. All of our work was team-based. So you got assigned to a team at the beginning of the semester or the class. These were like highly intensive three-week um, classes. And, um, so you work in these in, in these teams and you, um, do a lot of, you know, kind of group work, you split off and you go into a small group and you have a short, finite amount of time to come up with some kind of presentation, right? So in those groups, a lot of, um, discussion and the debate will happen, you know, as we, figure out, okay, what are we going to come back with? How are we going to present? What are we going to present? Um, how do we apply the theory that we just learned about? And so a lot of the peer feedback that would come back in the, the end of the semester often stemmed from those sessions, right? And I've always been someone who, like, I'm quick to raise my hand in school, you know, like I, I sometimes would just like blurt out the answer and I would have to learn, you know, early in my, you know, schooling that I was supposed to raise my hand, but I would always be the first one to raise my hand when a question was asked by the teacher. And there were a couple of reasons for that. First of all, if I knew the answer, I was excited to share it. Um, second of all, if nobody said anything, I felt this responsibility to help the teacher by saying something, right? Because I didn't like that awkward silence and I felt sorry for the teacher if nobody said anything. So I would be the first to speak often out of care for the teacher and for the quality of, you know, the experience of wanting to help get the conversation going. You know, so that's kind of a, a trend I had carried forward into my adult life. And as I find myself in grad school and you know, I'm, I'm a, a relatively outgoing person and we would be in these groups and, you know, they would sometimes be slow to start and I would start off the conversation. I would throw an idea out on the table and, you know, my assumption was if I start, others will feel comfortable to jump in. And after one of the courses, my peer evaluation said that I was, you know, loud and opinionated and that I was controlling and that I was, um, I don't know, there were a whole bunch of ways in which someone had perceived me that were very, very different from my intention, right? And I realized at that moment that my enthusiasm 
when I'm not aware of the other people in the room can often be um, translated as overpowering. And it can have the opposite of effect of what I intended, which was to encourage, you know, by my, me enthusiastically jumping in, throwing out ideas, uh, thinking that that would encourage others. Um, for some people, it had the opposite effect where they felt less free to share their ideas because my voice was the loudest. And so what I learned from that was to, you know, ask the quiet people in the room for their opinion or their idea and to solicit other input um, and to just tone it down sometimes and be quiet and allow for others to speak. But that was kind of one of those first experiences where I had this aha moment that led to greater awareness and greater emotional intelligence of reading the emotions of the people in the room that I had been completely unaware of. You know, this piece of feedback kind of just took me by surprise because it was so different. The perception was so different than my intention. Yeah, I mean, I think anytime we're perceived in a way that isn't what we know our values to believe, that's it cuts deep, you know. And especially for courageous leaders, you know, if we're out there, if we're putting our ideas forward and, you know, similar challenges with those groups, you know, it's, you know, I'm putting it out. Nobody else is saying anything. Well, I know we have to go somewhere. So here's an idea. Let's get going. And like the, you know, those dynamics of the eyes and, and those introverts on the team and the folks that are still processing what it is exactly we're supposed to do. Like they never even get to the table and it, you know, I had to become socially aware enough to invite them in and then like the awareness to start chartering teams and say things like, you know, I don't believe everything that I say. I'm just trying to see thought, you know, don't, don't take me saying something as I believe it. Like I'm just trying to explore with you. So yeah, but I remember just the degrees of anxiety I would have for the days we got the feedback packets, you know, and, and, but over time I learned how to manage those things or manage how I showed up. Um, but my, my kind of keystone moment, um, and it, it like, it's a little haunting to this day, um, is I was, I was in a development program and like we had all the, you know, we had a schedule and you had all these things planned and, you know, you had a couple that were purely about like that windshield time and fellowship and like getting to know one another. And we had one of those events coming up and I was really excited about it. And like over the course of time, like what, it, uh, what had happened is the person leading the program for us, like had a death in the family. And I'm certain that that communication came across and I was probably, you know, had my head in work or was busy transacting. And then I got a cancellation for the event. They, like for this, the, it was like a float trip or something. You know, it was where all 24 of us were going to go on this, you know, excursion. But due to the death in the family of the leader, um, like that was canceled. Well, then I happened to, you know, run into that program leader, like in real time. And I'm like, you know, so what's up? Like the events canceled, you know, like just not connecting the reason why the event was canceled was that, you know, this person had a, a close family member pass away to the cancellation of the event. Like I just, the, probably the most least self-aware thing that I've ever done. And I, like I said, to this day, like I feel terrible about it, not connecting those things and then showing up in a way that is unintentional. Like, I love this person. I care for this person. And here I am saying like, man, that sucks. We don't get to go floating on Wednesday, you know, without thinking this person's got a funeral to attend that day or, or the day after, or, or in just how I showed up in that moment was horrible. And like, I don't want to feel that way. Like it's a, it's something I carry with me today and I don't want to carry more than one of those. 
So that, you know, that's kind of my pivotal moment of like, I'm just looking at that whole situation going, how dumb can you be? You know, like how complete lack of self-awareness. Um, so anyway, that was my, my moment. Um, I just try to be better, you know? Well, thank you all for sharing. You know, a couple of things stand out for me. One was just a, an assessment. So we'll get in here uh, in a little bit about just what is EQ when we say emotional intelligence, what is that? But whenever it was really starting to hit mainstream, you know, 15 years ago, uh, took a short little self-assessment and the results that it kicked back were like, you know, you're in the 30th percentile or 40th percentile on emotional intelligence or something like that. And I was like, well, no, well, hold on a second. Like bad assessment, something's wrong with the data, you know? Like I'm a, I'm an effective leader. Like people like me, people follow me. Like this can't be true, but you know, I being, I guess, intellectually honest enough to say, okay, it's probably not the assessment. Like I, and even if it is, it's a 10% swing, you know, or margin of error. So I'm not in the top, you know, 80th, 90th percentile of this thing. Like I, that's not the reality. So I have some work to do. There's some things I, I should learn. So that was one. And then I've told this story before, but, you know, really had an experience one day uh, driving on, on a trip uh, where I asked someone like, what, give me some feedback. What can I do differently? And, and really asked honest questions and dug in there. And the big thing that came away was people, you know, perceived me as being arrogant and condescending towards them. And uh, people on the team that I was serving with, like really believed that I thought they were uh, stupid, you know, in some way. And that wasn't my intent at all. And so started, you know, really becoming intentional to, to mitigate that and come across differently. And to me, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer the question first. This isn't a historical answer about what is emotional intelligence. It's more of an outcome answer, but like, what is EQ? To me, it's, it's being intentional about how people perceive me and that the words I say, the way that I show up, my behavior really does align with my intent and with my values and how I want to relate to people and, and what impact I want to have in the lives of other human beings who are on some level, you know, emotional creatures. And so, um, yeah, emotional intelligence to me is intentionality and purposefulness in how I connect with folks. But, you know, Hannah, I'm curious, I feel like you're a bit of an expert in this area. Um, you know, what is emotional intelligence? Like, give us some context. What are we talking about here? Yeah. So I think what, what you mentioned, Luke, it's to your point, it's more of an outcome. Um, it had in order to be able to be intentional about how we show up, it starts with awareness. First of all, having the awareness of my own emotional state, um, what is it that I'm feeling and experiencing right now and having the awareness of how that translates out into the world. So what impact am I having and what impact is my emotional state having on the people around me? And that's, you know, in, throughout kind of our um, EQ awareness series that, that phrase uh, or that word awareness is key, right? And that's why we have these conversations and why we work with our client partner organizations, um, whether they be consultants or salespeople of, you know, or, or leaders, um, having get greater awareness, you know, and, and how do we become aware, right? It's often through feedback. It could be formal, like an evaluation process what that what I experienced. It could be um, through an assessment like you experienced, Luke, or it could be informal, Chris, in the way that people just respond to us and we all of a sudden become aware that, oh, I was completely misinterpreted in that moment or I had no clue, I had no situational awareness. Um, and so I think for me, emotional intelligence, and we also use the term EQ kind of interchangeably, um, the emotional quotient, right? In the past, historically, intelligence was measured through IQ. 
And in the more recent years, I think it's becoming clear through the research that there are many types of intelligence. Um, and so for me, that's become a big theme too of when I encounter people, I don't look at them in terms of, and I'm someone who is attracted to intelligence, right? Intelligence has always been something that uh, draws me in, in a person. And, and now rather than evaluating someone on, are they intelligent or not? I look at them and, and I think about in which way is this person intelligent, right? Um, and some people have very high levels of emotional intelligence, of EQ. And there's been, you know, a lot of studies that show what an impact that has on, on leadership and how far you go in, in an organization. Um, it, it's, it's not your technical knowledge and your technical expertise that will get you so far, but what will really get you very far is your level of emotional intelligence. Yeah. And I really, you know, connect with that explanation around so much of it's about awareness. I'm aware of how I'm actually feeling and processing my own emotional process. And I'm aware of how that emotional process is being perceived and relating with the emotional process of others. I mean, I think about an actor who's performing in front of a mirror, right? And if your mirror is dirty and you're not seeing an accurate, you know, perception of, of what you're doing, your emotions are going to be off, right? Your delivery is going to be off. And so the work of emotional intelligence to me, this, this work of awareness is a lot about just cleaning the mirror, right? Cleaning our mirror off so that we actually have a, a realistic perception of how we're communicating and, and how other people are seeing and receiving it. So Chris, you know, what's, what's EQ to you? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think awareness is a great, um, is a great jump off point. I mean, it's self-awareness and social awareness um, in, in the self-awareness kind of cueing into self-management. And if I'm aware of how I show up now, I can manage how my values show up through my behaviors. Um, and then all of this in the context and why it's such an important leadership um, trait is like the re relationship management. They ultimately how we influence, the way that we coach, how, you know, what our role is within particular teams. You know, it, that's what it really anchors to is how am I managing the relationships that are required or I'm obliged to contribute to as a leader? Because ultimately, I want to move this team, this community, this organization. We want to move it forward. We want to advance that purpose. But key to making that happen is me managing how I show up and not just how I believe I show up, but how are people interpreting and responding to my behaviors? So really dorky way to say it, but those, you know, those components of self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management, you really have two types of awareness that yield two types of management. And key to that, you know, that social awareness and in, in, in my story, like just that complete lack of empathy in that moment. And I could, you know, read the look on that person's face and know like how they felt in that moment and how I made them feel and me to take responsibility for that and manage myself differently as a result. Um, you know, so that. That's kind of structurally what it looks like to, to kind of get into the neuroleadership side of it. It's really prefrontal cortex versus amygdala, right? That emotional center of our brain being the amygdala, the strategic center of our brain being the prefrontal cortex. And you know, that concept of emotional hijack, like that all lives in the, the amygdala my strategic thought and how I process um, circumstance when I'm calm and I'm not stressed when I have low cortisol, that all happens in the prefrontal cortex. So 
controlling cortisol, getting our prefrontal cortex to kind of have this dance with the amygdala, and then being self-aware enough to interject and, and intervene in those highly emotional, high, high cortisol moments. So there's physiology attached to EQ that is a little bit different than some other leadership traits. And uh, I think that's what makes it a little different is we're really having to short circuit natural response to show up in a way that is most effective. And that's something about leadership. It is not about being right. It is about being effective and being right is all in my amygdala and being effective is all in my prefrontal cortex. So that's, that's a bit of my take on what it is. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on the whole cortisol implication and physiology, Hannah? I know you have thoughts around that. Yeah, I have thoughts. Um, and I think just to bring you a little more, bit more nuance to how emotion works in, in the brain is, you know, there. So the brain is an incredibly complex machine. Um, and what is becoming clear through all the research as we're learning more about how the brain works is that emotion is such a part of every process, um, every action that we take, every action we don't take, every decision we make. Um, and the amygdala is the center for emotional intensity. And there are different parts of the brain that regulate other aspects of emotion, but the emotional intensity of I'm feeling something really, really strongly. And that is something that happens first on the subconscious level, right? As our brains are always scanning the environment for threats, we're very good threat detectors. So if we perceive something to be a threat, there's an alarm bell going off in the amygdala. You know, there's a, a signal being sent that provides an evaluation of positive or negative. Is this good for me or is this bad for me? Is this a threat to me? Is this something that's going to help me? Right. And the beauty of the human brain, you know, Chris, that you alluded to, why we're different is that we have this large prefrontal cortex that is that has the ability to evaluate those experiences once it comes into conscious awareness. That is why the awareness is so important because a lot of this happens without our, our awareness and we become reactive and reactionary. And that's how we're wired because we are, we've come very far as a human species. We've survived as, as a species and as individuals as long as we have because of this ability to detect threats and because of this ability to react in danger. Um, but sometimes, you know, well, all, all the time, the brain doesn't know the difference between a real danger and a perceived, you know, psychological danger or, or threat. And so having the ability to ask questions and get curious, I think, is the first step to greater awareness. And we can do that with ourselves first, right? What is it that I'm feeling right now? Why am I experiencing this level of emotion? And as soon as you start labeling the emotion, your brain switches into the prefrontal cortex and we get into a state of evaluation. And because the brain can only do one thing effectively at a time, either we're feeling strongly or we're thinking clearly. So when we can switch into the thinking part of the brain, that emotional intensity subsides and we can get out of um, a hijack situation and, and then, you know, recognizing, so self-awareness is a big piece of it, but then also having that awareness of others, of being aware of what others are experiencing in this situation and how we need to show up as leaders to support them. Yeah, but it, it's interesting though, like we, cortisol isn't all bad, right? Like we need some level of stimulation. We need to get amped up, you know, no, no amplitude, like we're bored too much. We get too amped up, like way performance constrained, too focused on the emotion, too amygdala centric. Like there's an optimum le level that will stimulate our amygdala and we can get that dance going with being strategic in our response to this emotional drive. And that's, I think where, 
the most developed leaders really can reside in that space and operate really well from that space. And that's, you know, technical function is, is priority for about 35% of all jobs out there. You know, emotional function and relationships is, is a dominant trait for 85% of the jobs out there. So, um, and I think that number continues to grow as we become a more service centric economy. And, and it just, at the end of the day, it, you know, other than being the structural thing, EQ is also a requirement for leadership performance. Well, I think it's one of the, or what the research would show, this isn't personal opinion, they, one, it's one of the four pillars for leadership performance as we enter new systems and new, and new versions of this economy. Like, yes, technical skills and competency still matter a ton. You have to be able to do the threshold requirements of the work, but outside of those technical skills, it's a, per, a leader's emotional intelligence, their ability to innovate, and the sense of purpose that they themselves selves have and that they inspire in the team around them. That there's a sense of meaning to the work that's being done. They, that's how the world has developed. And EQ is, is the second of the four pillars, you know, how we manage those relationships. And what's, what's interesting is, is Levels of EQ within leaders and organizations are predictors of a lot of things. They predict better job satisfaction. They predict higher levels of team and organizational commitment, uh, better job performance, higher levels of engagement, better physical and mental health, right? As people learn to self-manage and regulate and have healthier social relationships. And they also... Uh, leaders and teams with high levels of emotional intelligence are also better citizens. They have higher senses of obligation to their communities and, and senses uh, of obligation to contribute in a meaningful way to the progress of their environment. And that's, I mean, we could talk a lot about why this is happening. Okay. Like we've talked before, you know, parental authority and parental engagement is being reduced. Governance is being reduced. The role of church is being reduced, right? We now have high degrees of individual ownership around like establishing a purpose for our own lives, you know, finding a system for us to exist in that it has those shared beliefs and then contribute in meaningful ways to advance that. So I think that's the, I guess, erosion or the change in those other three structures I think have to be creating some of that demand. And, you know, this isn't a political or social commentary podcast, but that's, that's what I think is creating some of that um, demand. And I, I think changes of generation and just some natural evolution. Uh, but this is where we are today. And, you know, I don't know if in 50 years we're talking about emotional intelligence, but I know that it is a matter that is relevant today. That's really interesting because what I hear you say, if I was going to repeat that back, is that in the past, potentially we abdicated some of our moral reasoning ability to people in public uh, leadership or leadership in faith communities or whatever. As those things erode to some degree, right, folks have to take responsibility for um, on, on a personally, emotionally informed decision making, which that's really interesting. I don't think I've heard it put that. I think it fuels a lot of struggle on a mass scale, you know, because we're still looking up for hierarchical answers and they just, it, that's what the cancel culture kind of works against, right? Like, you know, you can't say what you believe, 
people won't listen to you. You'll be canceled. <laughs> you know, like there's no, there's very little platform to be like values forward in the ways that we have been in the past because every belief stands on its own merit and however you that person chooses to exist in whatever community they want to create that's okay i mean that's the it's just the evolution of the free world and like there's no reason to fight against it that just creates suffering like this is the way it's evolving um we you know things are softer now than they were 70 years ago. There's not as many clear lines. We don't have hierarchical instruction. You know, like people question their CEOs. We question our president. We question our governor, like in ways that we never did 70 years ago. And by the same token, groups are allowed to exist today that 70 years ago, there was no way they would have existed. So, I mean, it's just, I accept the evolution of it, but I think that's what creates so much onus on us as individuals to develop purpose, to put ourselves in shared belief systems and communities where we can contribute and and support the people around us. So Hannah, how about how about you? Why is emotional intelligence important for leaders today? Yeah, I think one of the main reasons, other than what you guys have already touched on, is the implication of uh, or the link between emotion and learning. So in our previous episode, we we talked about this notion of personal ownership, right? Which is a, another theme that's coming through in our conversation today. And we talked about, you know, when, when change is sort of thrust upon you, you can choose to get resentful um, or you can choose to take a learning attitude with a growth mindset, approaching things with a growth mindset. And, and so the interesting part of the physiology and, you know, Chris, you mentioned the amygdala and, and we hear a lot about the amygdala because of the amygdala hijack, right? But the amygdala is only one part of the limbic system. There are four parts of the limbic system in the brain, which are all have some, you know, contribution to learning. And so the hippocampus is, is the part of the limbic system um, that really plays a big role in both memory and emotion. So in the brain, location matters. So functions of the brain that are located near each other have a strong tie. And so our centers for memory and being able to retain and remember information is very centrally located to one of the main centers for emotion, which is in the hippocampus. So that means memory and emotion are tied together when we remember, so we rem, we have emotional memories and it influences our ability to, you know, what we're feeling and experiencing in a certain setting influences our ability to recall that information later. So as we look to become learning organizations and individuals who look to learn, having awareness of what we're feeling and experiencing and what kind of emotional setting we're creating for the people around us has a huge implication in what they take away, what they learn and what we learn. And, and the interesting part about that is, you know, when we're having a positive experience, when we're having fun, when we're experiencing positive emotions, that memory is richer and deeper and more nuanced. And we remember details, right? Uh, when we think back to negative memories that we've had, the the emo the sense of emotion is really strong, like what we felt, but what we remember about the situation and the details are kind of diffuse. And so to be able to create, you know, as a leader, an environment in which people can learn and grow and be their best selves, creating that positive environment where people are feeling positive emotions towards each other towards the organization itself, towards its purpose, um, are really critical skills. And, and to me, that is probably one of the most important reasons why emotional intelligence matters in, in leadership. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in such a time of learning, right? That's been a theme for 2020. Yeah, our health, safety, livelihoods are threatened right? And it's really encouraged folks to lean into learning in ways that maybe we haven't before. The learning model that I 
I really hang my hat on um, that I think is most helpful is developed by my friend Greg Robinson. He, uh, he says that all learning begins with a disturbance to the status quo and then puts us into a space of chaos where what we trusted before, what we knew before is no longer valid. And then we have a choice where we either can lean into the chaos and let go of that old way of being to move us into a space of learning, or in that chaos, we try and reach back. We try and get back however we can to the old status quo, which essentially shortcuts, short circuits that learning cycle, right? And we, we don't truly get to learning. But to me, this idea of a disturbance happening, being thrown into chaos, and having to be in that space where we're able to let go of what was and move towards something new that's unknown, like that's that's at its core an emotional process, right? I can say it, I can conceptualize it, I can draw it out on a whiteboard, this learning cycle, but to live it is an emotional experience. To have, you know, your cheese moved <laughs> or whatever it is, right? To have the status quo kicked out from under you and in this space of chaos, like if we're not aware of our emotion uh, in, in that moment, oftentimes we aren't even aware that we're in the learning cycle, that there is an opportunity for us to learn and grow. And that's just individually. Like when you also put yourselves in the shoes of a leader to say, okay, as a team, as an organization, we've had the status quo kicked out from underneath us. We're all in chaos. I, it's my responsibility or my hope to capitalize on the opportunity presented that I want to get this team, this organization into the emotional space where we can let go of what was and move forward into some sort of unknown. And only in moving forward into that unknown are we going to learn what we need to know to rebuild something that's new and better. Like, if I enter into that without being aware of emotional intelligence and the practices of emotional intelligence, like I'm going into a, going into a, a brawl without a, without a weapon, right? It, it, it's going to be painful. So. Yeah. I love that Luke, because that whole idea of like fortified cities, right? It, those walls are built to protect that city from the disruption or from the dragon or whatever, you know, and it's really getting outside of that, like not hiding from what we don't know, but going out and seeking it. And, you know, like Spencer Johnson and who moved my cheese, like the very first conference I ever went to, he spoke at and like, what a gift that was. It, it was amazing. And so much of everything about life and EQ, like there's some really profound things in that really simple book. That, you know, and you've got the two mice, him and Haw, that just sit around in the fortified place and eat the cheese. And you got Skit and Scurry that are always out there looking for new cheese and knowing what dangers exist around the corners. And um, so the idea in the book is like to be Skit and Scurry, like default to action, go out and like seek to slay the dragons. They like go after what you don't know. Don't be happy, you know, setting and being learned and fortified. Um, and I, I think that's, it's a huge part of EQ is defaulting to action. Like you, you cannot develop emotional intelligence if you're not skit and scurry. You have to get out there and do the things like, it, you know, seek to advance your purpose or your commitments every day. Um, and in doing that, you know, once the cheese was old and moldy in that book, there was nothing they could do about it. Like it was, was not manageable. And so a key takeaway is if we are out there seeking knowledge, learning, like we are able to deal with problems before they get unmanageable. When we fail to do that, we put ourselves in a situation to be managed by the system that we we're in. So versus us being in control and defining our route, when we, when we become learned and, and fortified, we are subject to the system. Hannah, 
closing thoughts? Yeah, I think just to, to sort of wrap up and some of my takeaways here are, you know, there's, there's very important implications for leaders to become more, first of all, self-aware, then aware of others and, you know, are self-aware in terms of our own emotional states, aware of the emotional states of other people. And that is really empathy, right? So being able to have empathy in the way that we um, recognize what others are feeling and, and be able to support and provide a structure for which we can um, help others manage their own emotional states um, and, and how we all impact, uh, have an impact on one another. And then that implication for learning of how we are aware of the culture and the emotional wake that we leave behind. The culture we create, the emotional wake that we leave behind, what are others feeling after leaving our presence has an implication on not only their experience, but also their ability to learn. Yeah. And ultimately, anything in the EQ competencies it for leaders, it, it, yes, it's helpful for all humans that we develop this capacity, but for leaders specifically, it is all a route to influence. Like if we think of, you know, we, when we look at EQ, we kind of break it up as an unlocking EQ is about, you know, connecting, executing, and developing some differentiating capacities that separate that 1% leader from the 10% leader. So, you know, what is that last competency in that differentiating spectrum? It is influence like persuasion, they like can I advance the purpose that I wish to adhere to? And that's really what it is about is, is can I create, can I inspire, can I coach? Uh, and what are my levels of awareness required? And what are the requisite behaviors, learning nimbly, defaulting to action, uh, being trustworthy? What are these behaviors that allow me ultimately to persuade? to influence, to advance, and, and, you know, have some sort of meaningful impact on the system that I operate within. Yeah, such good stuff. Um, thank you all for your thoughts, your leadership, leading with emotional intelligence. I know that I learn from each of you and become more emotionally intelligent myself because of our conversations. And that's kind of what I want to close with is that, this is a really hard journey alone. The journey of emotional intelligence, you know, working on emotional intelligence as a competency for yourself, becoming aware of how you present to others and how people leave your presence uh, feeling, what they're taking with them. It's really hard to do. And so if you need help, reach out. Uh, we're certainly here. If you have other folks uh, in your organization, friends, family, that can be that sounding board that can help wipe that mirror clean for you so you can see yourself clearly, right? And be able to uh, align your actions, your words uh, with your intent and with your values, then uh, please do that. Please take that action, default to action and move forward. And, um, you know, this is also what we do. Right, we we provide coaching, we provide 360 assessments uh, and other assessments to help provide that clarity. So uh, we're here. You can find us at purposeandperformancegroup.com or any of your social platforms, or uh, by following us uh, on Magic in the Room. So Hannah, Chris, thank you so much, everyone who's listening. We appreciate you and your time. Thank you for being courageous leaders who are making this world a better place. 